your Bibles with me to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 19. We're going to finish it today, God willing. Revelation chapter 19. We're going to look at verses 11 through 21. Now, if you remember last week, we were again in chapter 19, 1 through 10, and we were looking again at, at really a scene in heaven. All the, the battle has been behind us. We saw much of the judgment coming up to that point, and the key thing in, in many of those chapters was they would not repent. God was giving every person in this world a chance to acknowledge Him and repent of their sins. But there's a point in time when God must bring that final judgment. Now let me stop and insert something here. When we talk about the body of Christ, we talk about different denominations, but the world also calls some that are cults part of the body of Christ. Within the body of Christ is a mission field, and many within the body of Christ will not be saved in the end. Unless a person's born again, they will not enter the kingdom of God. There are many people that are deceiving themselves. They're going through the moves. They're coming to church, giving, singing, fellowshipping, but they do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So, 2 Corinthians in a different context, but it, it still works. He was challenging the Corinthians to examine themselves and see if they're of the faith. When we come to texts like this, we have to examine ourselves. Are we really believers? Are we really trusting in God? Are we doing things and just going through the moves? Please do not deceive yourself. Let's open in prayer. Father, thank you for your word that is timeless. It's applicable today. It has application for us in every area of our life. Lord, you tell us the things that are right and pleasing, the things that are wrong, and how we can get right and how we can stay right and Father, we want to keep ourselves right in the middle of your love. Open the eyes of our hearts today. Let us see you, your mercy, your grace, your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you remember last week also, I showed you that, you know, and in, oh, for those that are visiting today on the screens, when I give cross-references, they will go up on the screens and you can follow. But the Bible interprets itself. We do not go to the newspaper to interpret the Bible, to astrologer. But let the Bible speak. The Holy Spirit was given to you and me as believers to lead us in all truth. And if we allow Him to do it, He teaches us to discern what is of Him and what is not of Him. Because what you and I need is what He has for you and me. Now the world is something different. They have different views. There was a time that Christianity, it was okay to be a Christian. Oh, it's good you're a Christian. But people don't say that today. A few years ago, well, it's good to be a Christian. If you're weak, you need to be a Christian. And they would have all kinds of excuses. Now, if you say you're a Christian, they kind of sneer oftentimes. They sneer because they have a, a hatred for God. They don't want to be accountable for God. And I want to start, again, it may seem odd, but I want to read it from Psalm chapter 2. It will go on the screen, 12 verses. But it really tells us 
the people of the world, they're, they're thinking, even though you may not see it, it's slowly evolving more and more. In some areas in the world you see it stronger than you do here. But it is increasing the same thing here in the United States. Psalm 2 begins this way in verse 1, Why are the nations in uproar and the people devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand. The rulers take a counsel together against the Lord, against His anointed, saying, Let us tear the feathers apart and cast their cords from us. He who sits upon the heaven, heavens laughs, and the Lord scoffs at them. Then He will speak to them in His anger. Now, let me insert something there. The Scripture doesn't say that, but if you're reading the whole Bible, you'll understand what I'm saying. His anger is a holy anger, and none of us here have a holy anger, just anger. So, with that said, that anger, and terrified them in fury, saying, But as for me, I've installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain, and I will surely tell all, all of the decree of the Lord. And he said to me, You are my son today, and I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. And you shall break them with a rod of iron, and you shall shatter them like earthenware. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence, and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to his son, and he, he not become angry, or that he not become angry, excuse me, and you will perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are you who take refuge in him. There's a world that hates God. And this is what we're talking about, this judgment, because what we're seeing is the second coming of Christ. Now, it's not going to give every detail. It's, it's not exhaustive text, but it's giving us what is going to happen. We saw last week again, we saw the church was in heaven. We saw the, that marriage feast and the wonder of all of that. And you and I are presented perfect white garments and now we have this contrast of the second coming of Christ. First coming, he, he came in forgiveness. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. Whosoever believe in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Probably every one of us can quote that. But do we believe that? If we believe that, then we will share that with other people. He came with forgiveness. His, his desire was to reconcile man to himself. But when he comes back the second time, he comes in judgment. That's what we're going to see today. The judgment of God on a Christ-rejecting world. Now, this is not uh, his coming in the air when the, when the church is caught up to be raptured with him. We saw that back in Revelation chapter 4. But this is when he comes in his feet, literally, he lands on, again that sounds like an airplane coming in, forgive me, he kind of floats down there, however that is, on the Mount of Olives, and it splits. He comes back to judge a world that rejects the truth that would set them free. Well, again, look with me in the first verse, verse 11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he sat upon it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. So what we see is the, the appearance of the king. John begins, again, this is a vision. He looks up and he sees the heaven open. The doors are open, except for it's not like Stephen, when Stephen was being stoned, if you remember, in the book of Acts. Being persecuted by the world, by the, the religious people. 
And Stephen looked up and saw in the heavens, saw Jesus welcoming him. But Jesus is now coming back. He's coming back in judgment. And we're going to see these descriptions of him as we go through. So he's riding a, a white horse, followed by the armies of heaven. And also, uh, they're riding white horses. And this becomes very confusing. The question always arises, is this symbolic or is this literal? Maybe you remember the mobile gas ads. I think it was mobile. They, they had a white horse with wings flying. I don't know, but as we talk about the judgment, and when we see the people coming on horses in, and they're on foot, that also tells us about the condition of the world and the importance, and I'll bring that up as we look at, look at that, and I believe he's probably coming on horses, not white Mustang cars, but horses, something that the people are familiar with. Because even though the earth is going to be destroyed and Jesus is going to destroy it, and there will be a new heaven and the earth, again, the armies of the world will come also on horses and on foot because they don't want to destroy the land of Israel. And we talked about that in Ezekiel 38, and we talked about that again, the important, because the oil fines that they found and the natural gas fines. You don't want to shoot missiles and rockets and, and destroy the land and destroy the resources because the resources are precious and they're going to need them. Well, again, notice again, he's riding on a, a white horse. Quite a contrast if you go back to chapter 6 and you see a, a white horse, the apocalypse, the false Christ coming on a white horse, deceptive. Here we have the one that's called faithful and true. What a contrast. Again, the color white, it doesn't speak of purity. When we're given white garments, that speaks of purity. But remember, when this was written, it was written about 90 AD, 95, some say, somewhere in that area. White, white horses always meant victory. And then when they come back into a city from conquering you know, from a far land, they would ride on these white horses and were victorious. So there's symbolism in here, and it's an understanding how would they understood at that time, not what we think. That's where it becomes very dangerous with newspaper interpretation because they're looking at it from today's views and not how they would have understood it at that time. Historically, the white stone was another interesting thing. It was given to the victors of games. It was used as an entrance to banquets. The white manna, the white stone, suggests different types of eternal blessings. The Lord is bringing an end to sin. The world ultimately will be destroyed as you and I know it. Well, again, what we notice next is really the writer's title. I love this, Faithful and True. Does anyone here feel very faithful in the Lord? I, I have to take my hand down. I, I'm, I'm in the Word, I read, I study, I, I go about what I believe is the Father's business, but I know that this flesh is weak. There are times that I'm impatient. There may be times that I may be unkind, I don't want to be, and I have to go back and confess and repent. But Jesus is faithful and true. He's, he's consistent in every way. He's been tested. He's been proved. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And all of our sins, every man in this world and woman, their sins have been imputed to him. Again, three hours of darkness, so dark when that was happening. The scripture doesn't even record it for us to understand because I don't think we can comprehend every one of your sins. Well, again, this writer is identified again as Jesus as we go through it time and time again. In establishing, again, what's important is he comes, he is the faithful. And he's the true witness. 
you and I are to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. When they look at your life and my life and they look at our past, they say, there must be a God. Because our lives have been radically changed. And still changing because we're still here. Now, as faithful and true, he, he's coming to establish truth and justice. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is truth. When he came, the first time, one of the things he came was to reveal the Father. When you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's, he's revealing truth. And everything that Jesus has ever said is truth. Now, what I like here is that the word faithful means reliable, trustworthy, stable, unchangeable, sure. You can trust and you can rest in the promise of God and not worry about a thing. But we do worry sometimes, don't we? Is that true? Will I really get there? Have I really been good enough? These questions can be answered as we go through the whole counsel of God's Word. He's deprogramming us from this world thinking and reprogramming us with the word of truth. Thy word is truth. Sanctify us by the truth. We're washed by the water of the word. Not only is he faithful, he's true. He's genuine. You know, have you ever met somebody that just seems so perfect, got it all together, and you wonder, is this really true? Is this really genuine? I mean, they got it all together, and then maybe they open their mouth and go, oh, it's not genuine. I hope that's not true about you and me. But when you and I do blow it, that we do everything we can to make that right, first by confessing, and two, and repenting. Being honest, transparent. I love, a few weeks ago we did a funeral for Mr. Hathaway, Glenn Hathaway, and he, uh, 101 years old. It's on our website under media if you want to look at it. And one of the things his son said, I never heard my father lie, and no one ever said he lied. Gosh, don't you wish they could say that about you? Because we are not always that true picture. We're not always that faithful witness. Well, again, that horse's rider is the son of man. That was a favorite term of Jesus, a messianic title coming from Ezekiel. We, we saw it when we went through the book of Matthew, and he is the son of God. He is God in the flesh. And he tabernacled among us. Well, again, he who set upon is called faithful and true. And he, again, righteously, he judges and he wages war. Let me read from Psalm 96, verse 13. Before the Lord, for he, for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth, and he will judge the world in righteousness and the people's in his faithfulness. You know, I remember years ago in, in minor thing, and uh, I was in Keokaha driving down there, and, and uh, an officer pulled me over, and he says, you weren't driving with a seatbelt. And I had a seatbelt on. In fact, when I pulled, before I pulled on the street, I put the seatbelt on. There's nothing I could do about it. But his judgments are always righteous. He knows all things. There is not righteous judgment in this world in most cases. And the number one reason is we are not all knowing like him. He knows all things. We think we know all things. And what happens when we think we know all things? It certainly gets us in trouble. Have you experienced that? I have. 
and it sure is humbling. Well, it's at this point the world has exhausted God's patience. God is no longer patient. There is not one righteous person left at this point, this judgment. And this judgment is going to deal with, again, sinful, rebellious mankind. Who's going to hell? Only those who have rejected Jesus Christ. If a person hasn't received Jesus Christ, it's the same as rejecting. There will be horrible people in heaven who have been transformed when they were born again because they become new creatures in Christ. But in hell, there will be people that were good people, lived a good, what appears to be a good moral life, but they're hell one reason, because they rejected Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's why we say it's all about Jesus, a life that's focused upon Him. Well, again, it's Jesus now is judging. He's judging righteously. He's judging those who have rebelled and rejected Him. He doesn't send them to hell in that same sense as you and I might think, because hell was prepared for Satan and his demons. People choose hell. Choose today whom you will serve. If you do not choose to serve the Lord, you're serving the devil. Again, he comes to fulfill the promises, the promises of the covenant. Things that were written thousands of years before, many of those things were fulfilled in his first coming, but there's more. There's going to be a new heaven, a new earth with no sin, pain, and sorrow as we know it. He is the Alpha, and He is the Omega. It began with Him. He spoke things into existence, and it will end with Him. The fact He's called true puts further emphasis on the very fact that, that He is dependable. And I love that, that, that he is dependable. Look with me in verse 12. It says, his eyes are a, a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except for himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. His eyes are like fire. I've seen people that are angry in, in that sense but not really flames of fire. The expression goes that they're mad as hell, their face is red, their eyes they just have this, this anger. But see, what this fire symbolizes is a piercing, penetrating. He knows your heart, he knows your motives. I'm thankful for that as, as a believer because sometimes you know, I, I, I think I'm doing the right thing. I think I'm saying the right thing. But in the end, sometimes I go, gosh, that didn't come out the way I wanted. You ever have that happen to you? The motive can be pure, but the actions are wrong because we're still being refined in this life by Him. But we're kept by His power until that day. But the unbeliever is a different situation. He, he sees everywhere, even the dark places behind closed doors. His eyes search the innermost parts of our heart. He knows it all. He's omniscient. He's able to, to conquer all those who reject and do evil. Aren't you happy that I don't know your heart? What's going on in your mind? But God knows all things. And all things are open before Him. That's really kind of a good motivation to do things right, isn't it? If He knows it all. Because you don't want to be seen doing those things. So we cry out, Lord, save us from ourselves. His judgments are always just and always accurate because He knows the truth. You can't squirm out of it, worm out of it. He knows. 
he understands. Jeremiah 17, 10 says this, I the Lord, and the Lord is all caps if you notice there. That's referring to the covenant God, Yahweh, search the heart, I test the mind, even to give each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. Stop for a second, as a believer, the most wonderful thing is God doesn't give you what you deserve. What do you deserve? Hell, like me. But He gives us life. He gives us abundant life. And that life is in Christ Jesus. Amen. He gives us hope. He gives us purpose. And we become His workmanship. And He works in us. Jeremiah 23, 24 says this, Can a man hide himself in hiding places? So I do not see him, declares the Lord. Do I not fill the heavens and the earth, declares the Lord. Uh, meaning that he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He sees all, knows all. You cannot hide from him. Context of this is going to those that will be judged. He is a righteous and fair judge. Then notice his head is head is covered with these diadems. The, these signify crowns. Crowns signifying royalty. Notice he has many crowns. It's, it's alluding, pointing to the fact that he's the king of kings and lord of lords. Not just a crown of one kingdom, but, but of all the kingdoms. He's going to come and rule and reign. And the sad thing in one way when the millennial kingdom comes, he will rule and reign over that, and there will be many kingdoms, but he'll have to rule with a rod of iron. Even though Satan will be in the pit, people will still rebel against him. Gosh, I wish we'd get it right the first time, don't you? He's coming to conquer the kingdoms of the earth. This is what he's talking about. This is the, the second coming. He comes to fulfill all the prophecies and set up the, again this kingdom of David, the eternal throne forever. And bring about and fulfill his reign upon the earth, which is an everlasting reign. Notice the, the next phrase, the word of God. It's a, again John's distinctive designation for Jesus Christ. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's in verse 14, And the Word became flesh, dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, the glory of the only begotten Father, full of grace and truth. Now, uh, notice again, we saw His glory, and the glory of the only begotten Son. That glory, glory, you're going to think about that in a second because this is very significant. We sometimes miss the importance of the glory of God and the, the effect it has upon the second coming. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says this, God after He spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in so many portions and ways, in the last days He spoken to us by His Son whom He's appointed heir of all things and through whom He has made the world. So we see again, as I mentioned, that He is the, the Creator. God worked through Him. Now He also has a name that's written that no one knows. It's one of those mysteries, but He knows. In eternity you and I will come to know fully what that means. Let me jump to Luke. Luke 10, verse 22, All things have been handed over to me by the Father. No one knows who the Son is except for the Father, who the Father is except for the Son, and anyone whom the Son wills to reveal Himself. Let me ask you a question, personal. Has God revealed Himself to you? First of all, we know from Romans, Romans chapter 1, He reveals Himself to all creation. We are created in His image and likeness. We have a mind to reason and know Him. Emotions as God has emotions. We have a moral conscience. And every person, every child knows there must be a God when they begin to grow up until someone quenches that spirit. There's many ways that He reveals Himself 
But if you were born again, one day God spoke to you in some way about your sinfulness and in need of a Savior, and He is there to save you. And this is why we have testimonies here and there to share how God has revealed to each person. Well, the divine mystery veils part of the, the nature of the Son whom God speaks fully of. Let me read John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. But as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in His name, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Being born again means that we have a supernatural birth. It's when the Spirit of God comes in our life and changes us from the inside and inside out. And we now walk in the Spirit. His Spirit indwells our heart. He had been convicting us, but now being in our heart, He's leading us and guiding us. He's ever present. When He said He'd never leave you, forsake you, it's because His Spirit is in you. There's no place you can go. Look at verse 13, and he's clothed with a robe dipped in blood. Let me say something. It, it's interesting that this, this little phrase that I just kind of gave you, those are fighting words within the body of Christ. Because some say this is the battle of Armageddon, and some are going to say, well, this is the cross. Another group is going to say, well, it, it represents all the sin in this world, sinful man he's fought and, and it, it's the blood from all of that. It's just symbolic. Up front, for those that don't know, there's passages like this where we're confused, and I will talk a little more on it. I call the pan theory. The pan theory means in some things we just don't know for sure, but in the end we'll see how it pans out. God is in control. He's on the throne. And I don't need to know everything. I just need to know God. And if God is enough, then that's okay. Because we know where we're going, and we know that He's in sovereign control, and we know that He's faithful and true, and that He will keep each and every promise. Amen? Amen. The world doesn't know that. We know that when, when a loved one passes away, and they're in Christ, we will see them again. And we have that hope, a hope that the world doesn't have. What is it? The blood appears to be, it's speaking about Christ Himself. The passage is focusing on Him. And the only thing that I can come up with is, is really it's everything that He, it may be symbolic, everything that He's endured for you and me. That's a lot. Every one of our sins. Verse 15 goes on, from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress, fierce wrath of the God Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Now, if you remember last week, it was all focusing upon Jesus. And who was the center of the marriage feast? Not the bride. But Jesus Christ Himself, the King. Here the focus is still upon Him. And when He comes to fight this final battle, notice it says, and from His mouth comes this sharp sword. Let me stop there for a second. I want to remind you Whose battle is this in the world today? The battle is the Lord's. We fall in rank and we fall behind Him. We stand for righteousness and we stand for truth. But we fall behind Him. He is the one that will grant the favor. He's the one that opens and shuts doors. He's the one that raises up kingdoms and political leaders, and He's the one that tears them down. The battle is the Lord. God uses all these things in the world to shape us, mold us, make us dependent upon Him. But when it comes to this final battle, the battle is the Lord's. When we come back with Him, 
guess what? You don't have to put on all your armor. You don't have to worry about getting shot. The Lord handles it all. I'm so thankful for that. See, this sharp sword symbolizes really Christ's power to kill his enemies. Now, it's interesting, this, this sword comes out of his mouth. It indicates that he wins the battle with the power of the word. Now, there's, there's several things that will pull together, but in Isaiah 11:4, but with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth, and he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. You see it again. And with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. And then in Psalm 2, we read earlier, but verse 9, it says, And you shall break them with a rod of iron. Now, that word rod also could be used as a staff. It, it's speaking simply of the word of God, the law. Man is going to be busted. He's convicted. Undeniable. He can't say anything. Basically, in so many words, where they'll argue with you and me, and we shouldn't argue with people, they're downcast. There's nothing they can do. They can be angry as one, but there's nothing they can do can do. Though the saints return with Christ, this is important to rule and reign, we know that. We're not the executioners. I know that bums some people. <laughs> but that's the task. The task is before us. And it's the task of the angels. See, Christ will deal with it and the angels will deal with it. Because we're the bride of Christ. If you just got married, you're going to put your bride in the front line and you get in the back? I don't think so. Again, the iron rod speaks of a swift and a right judgment, a righteous judgment. His authority is unparalleled. As a divine warrior, he treads the wine press, it says, of God's wrath. Now, his robe is dipped in the foe's blood. Now, I'm going to read from Isaiah, and, and this may, again, contradict in some ways. You think about it. You're going to have to work this out in your mind. But I, like I said, I, I have some views, but in the end, I take the pan theory. Isaiah 63, 1 through 3 says this, Woe is this who comes from Edom with garments glowing, colors of Basra, this one who is majestic is in apparel, marching in greatness of strength. It is I who speak of righteousness and mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like one of the treads the wine press? I have trodden the wine, though alone. Catch that, though alone. And from the peoples there is no man with me. I also trod them in anger and trampled them in my wrath, and their lifeblood is sprinkled on my garments, and I've stained all the raiment. The idea is he, he goes, and he's the one that's judging, yes. The judgment, perhaps, all the people that he's sinful man he's dealt with. Maybe not just in Armageddon, but from all time. He's the righteous one, but he's the one that does it, and I'm thankful for that. I like what David Jeremiah said. He says, when we sing, all hail the power of Jesus' name, let the angels prostrate and fall, bring forth the royal diadem and the crown of him, the Lord of all, and we are proclaiming his coming again. And guess what? That's what we're going to do. We're just going to praise Him. We're going to stand in awe of Him. We're going to fall down prostrate. And we're going to see how all these things work out. We know what the end is. They're going to be destroyed. Only because they've not received Him as Lord and Savior. If that's a true statement, which it is, then we need to pray that God would open up the hearts and the minds of those people that we know that are not believers that they would come to know him. There is power in prayer. May we pray. Notice with me in verse 14, the armies 
which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, fine linen, white and clean. We're following him on white horses. There's your horses. Anyone, you like horses? You're going to get a chance to ride. We're, we're coming back with it. Maybe it only represents the presence. He's sure speaking about a lot of literal. You can't go in and out of symbolic. You can, you can have, a, a, again, a symbolic meaning that's used through the whole text, but not in and out. Because then you don't know what to believe and what not to believe. Who are these armies of heaven? Again, it's another dividing verse, depending on the camp, the denomination you're in. But what does the, the Bible teach? Again, it's composed of the church. In verse 8, we saw last week. The tribulation saints we saw in chapter 7 and verse 13. And in believers, when we get to Jude, Jude 14, and then Daniel 12, it talks about those believers. And then Matthew 25, 31, it even talks about angels. They simply return not to help Jesus, but they follow Him. Wherever He goes, we, we follow. We want to be with Him. Now, if you're married, I hope you want to be with your wife or your husband. If they're just going to the store, it's kind of nice to ride with them and be with them. Because after all, if we're married, we want that intimacy. We want to be with them. That's why we get married. How much more a heavenly marriage, as we talked about last week, one that was made in heaven that will last forever. Well, second, they, they come to reign with him. He defeats his enemies and we will rule and reign. That's another frustrating one. I, I don't want to reign over a city, someone says, and I don't want to be in charge of anything. I, I, I want to retire. Believe me, when you get to heaven, you will not, when you work, it will be productive work. There will be a joy. You will, you will enjoy being there, and you will judge righteously for the first time in your life. It's going to be totally different. You and I cannot understand it on this side of eternity. Again, their clothes, fine linen, white, clean, speaking of that, Purity, been set apart, washed by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus died for them on the cross. And again in Revelation 19.8, it was given to her to clothe herself with fine linen. That was speaking about the church, bright and clean for the fine linen. Notice the righteous acts of the saint. The righteous acts of the saints. Boy, it's more blessed to give. You ever notice that than it is to receive? And when, when someone tells you, gosh, I, I needed that prayer, I, I needed you to be there, and, and, and you realize that God can use you, there is a joy in being used by God. But when the world uses you, feel dirty, used and abused. Again, in Revelation 6, 1 is another illustration. It says, and they were given each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while until the number of the fellow servants and brethren who were killed even as they had been would be completed also. These, these were martyrs and, and given the robes, purity, set apart for God. They will come back too. God knows every person that has made a decision for Him. And as I mentioned, Revelation 7, 14, it said to him, My Lord, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. How do you make it white in the blood of the Lamb? Believing in him, trusting in him, and following him. Again, Scripture, as I mentioned so often, Luke 9, If anyone want to come after me, Jesus speaking, he must deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow him daily. That's what a true believer does. It doesn't mean that every one of us are going to be the persecuted church, but when the persecuted church is hurt around the world, we feel that, we grieve for that. But it means we made a commitment to him. Again, and they ride white horses and they're sharing in the victory and the celebration. So the, the question really in that, is it symbolic or is it literal? We'll see as it pans out. Look with me in verse 17. 
Then I saw an angel standing, notice, in the sun. You don't see angels standing in the sun. And he cried out with a loud voice, saying, To all the birds which fly in mid heaven, come and assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of the kings, the flesh of commanders, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and the flesh of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both men and slave, small and great. The ladies say, I don't want to hear this. I'm going to close my eyes. But you know the reality, what, what he's trying to say here is, it's important, is he's been patient, he's been long-suffering, but he must deal with sin. Remember Ezekiel says, I find no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked, and because he's righteous, he must judge sin. And this, as I read again from Psalm uh, chapter 2, the world wants to battle. They're going to gather together to fight against God. It's not that God chose, but he said this is the hardness of heart of man. This is what it, it becomes, the far end of this. Now, this is the great battle of Armageddon, Jezreel, Megiddo. It's the final battle of uh, human history as far as what we know in the world today. Now, Ezekiel 38 and 39, uh, many believe, and when we talked about that, it, it, there's going to be Ezekiel 38 and 39 fulfilled before the tribulation, but it's also going to be another time the same thing will happen. We kind of learned something from history, nothing, right? And they're going to repeat the same thing at the end of the Millennial Kingdom. Now, here though, this is the Battle of Armageddon, as I mentioned. Human history as we know, the world as we know it today where the Lord Jesus Christ intervenes and brings all this crazy madness to an end of humanity. This is where Jesus Christ returns to earth, destroys the ungodly and evil in this world. Now, this period of time, you know, there's, there's so many names. I'm only going to list a few of what the Bible calls this period of time. Uh, the great day of Jehovah. It's also called the great day of God, the day in, in some text. And then the judgment of God upon the, the godless governments of the world and the end of the devil's rule upon earth and the supper of the great God and the great battle of Armageddon and that last three and a half years of the tribulation, it's the time of Jacob. Well, the angels at this point send an invitation to the birds to pick the corpses clean. It's the great supper of God mentioned here. Now the first thing that how they would understand at that time is that is the most disgraceful thing to happen. There's not a burial. There's no dignity given to that person. When I do a funeral, the first thing I do, there's three things that we want to consider. First is, is really bringing glory to God. He's the one that brought that life into this world. Two, if they're believers, they saved him. So we want to we want to give glory to God. Second, we want to give dignity to that person. And finally, comfort. You you cannot find any of these things in these these events, this final event. They have chosen this. It's been prophesied, and anyone that wants to know it, and many of the people are going to know this word, and, and still will go against it. Deuteronomy 28, 26 says this, Your carcasses will be food to all the birds of the sky and the beasts of the earth, and there will be no one to frighten them away. To Indians, it's very disgraceful. They have to cover the body. In all cultures, they want to do something with the body. You can't, you can't leave it this way. This is the greatest shame. And yet they do ahead of time. Ezekiel 39, verses 17 to 20 says this, As for you, son of man... Thus says the Lord God, speak to every kind of bird, every beast of the field, and assemble, and come, and gather from every side, from 
uh, to my sacrifice, which I'm going to sacrifice for you. A great sacrifice on the mountains of Israel that you will eat the flesh and drink the blood. And you will eat the flesh and the mighty men and drink the blood of the princes of the earth. And though there were rams and lambs and goats and bulls and all the fatlings of Bashan, so you will eat fat until you have gluttoned and drink the blood until you are drunk. For my sacrifice I, I have sacrificed for you. And you will be glutted at my table with the horses and the chariots, with the mighty men and the men of war, declares the Lord God. It's not that there's not warning before wrath. God always gives warning before wrath. And the one thing we learn is nothing from history. The birds of prey, they will not distinguish one from another. This is the disgrace. This is the shame. No one, whether they're a king or whatever, has any more honor. In fact, everything is dishonor because they've rejected Jesus Christ. That's why they're here. The only reason they're here. You've heard of deathbed conversions where people are saved at that last moment. I've experienced it. Maybe you've experienced it. But there are no deathbed conversions. Man's heart has become so hard against God. Maybe you know someone who is an alcoholic, a drug addict, and they want nothing to do but that alcohol, that drug. They will do anything for it, give up anything for it, steal from their own family and friends, some to the far end of murder, selling their bodies. This is the kind of people, this is the end. This is what man becomes without God, and this is why God must judge it. Never to inoculate, never again to affect you or I. Again. So none of these have a, an honorable burial. There's no tombs, no names marked, no monuments erected in, in honor of these people because they're people of dishonor. question is how, how could humanly possible so many great armies of the world, because all the armies of the world are going to be gathering together. How could this even be? If a war is going to be fought in Palestine, why, why bother with even foot soldiers? As I mentioned this a, a, a little bit before. Well, we've talked about this and again in Ezekiel is they have all the sophisticated weapons, but they don't want to destroy the land. They think they can win. They think they can conquer God. They think they can take over. They think they can have the oil, the power. The reason is simple. The armies use foot soldiers to preserve the land and the resources. The end of time is exactly what will happen. And this is why so many, there's still people that believe that it's exactly as the Bible says. I'm a literalist. When the Bible makes common, ordinary sense, don't read anything else into it. There could be a symbolism, but that would be consistent. But you have to understand what, what it meant to those people. How would they understood it at that time? And that's how we interpret it. And if it was a symbol then at that time, then it could be a symbol for us today. So the Antichrist himself will not use any atomic weapons. And I'm hearing all kinds of stories and people are freaking out. Oh my gosh. Remember back in the 60s, we had bomb shelters all over the neighborhood because what was happening in Cuba? You know, perfect love cast out all fear. Do you know the love of God? It will cast out all fear. It doesn't mean I'm not going to be startled. It doesn't mean I, I'm not concerned because, yeah, I'm concerned about people that haven't received Jesus Christ. But for myself, if that time would come, to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. And in his presence is fullness of joy. 
Amen. And that, you know, we have so much to hope for. Again, look at verse 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth, the armies assembled or gathered in another translation to make war against him. See, they're coming against him who set up on the horse and against his army. So it's very clear the armies assemble. They assemble with the purpose of battling. Verse 20 and 21, it goes on, and the beast was seized with him, the false prophet who has performed signs or false signs, we could also say, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast. So we now realize there's another group of people, those who took the mark of the beast. They were fearing for their lives. They couldn't eat without the food. They couldn't buy or sell. I got to take the mark. Guess what? It's not the, the vaccination for COVID or this or that or your social security number. I've heard all through the years so many different things. Believe me, if that time comes, the mark of the beast, you will know it has to deal with the mark of the beast. Don't read between the lines. Verse 20, the beast was seized with him, the false prophet who performed the signs in the presence and by which would deceive those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worship, notice his image, these two were thrown in alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. Now, let me jump back to Revelation chapter 12. It, it kind of fits verses 5 through 8. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who was to rule the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God into his throne, and then the woman fled into the wilderness. She had a place prepared for God, and there she would be nourished for 1,260 days. This is the last half of the tribulation. The she is Israel, gave birth to the Messiah. The Messiah was caught up or ascended to be with the Father, but he's now coming back at this point. Verse 7, it went on, and it says, And there was a war in heaven. Michael's angels were waging war with the devil, or the dragon. And the dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough, and they were no longer a place found for them in heaven. So, we, we talk about in this end time, demonic activity is increasing around the world. Demonic delusion is increasing, and people are being deceived Satan no longer has access to heaven. He's been cast out, and he is moving. Now, you, he's not under every chair, under every rock, as some people do. But Satan is like, and there's only one Satan, a roaring lion looking for whom he may devour. And likewise, his demons are there. But greater is he who is in you than in the world, and you are kept by the power of God. You don't need to worry, but you need to be aware. This is what you're seeing that's going on. And, and when you see people and things going on, this is demonic. You're right. It is. The evil in the world is demonic, and he's looking to draw as many people away in the end. And many of these will be in this battle. Verse 21, our final verse, and the rest were killed with a sword which came from the mouth of him who sat up on the horse, and all the birds were filled with flesh. Gosh, so we end up with this sword. It's killed. The sword comes out of his mouth. It's the word of God. Think with me just for a moment, and, and I'll paint a picture for you. Jesus is standing in the Garden of Gethsemane, and they're coming to arrest him and take him away. And Jesus says, whom are you looking for? And you know, the next thing is they fall down on the ground. I am he, and they fall down. God's word is all powerful. You and I do not know how powerful the word of God is. It is so powerful if a person really wanted to know who Jesus Christ is and would open the word of God and say, God, if you are real, show me. It will convert you. It is powerful. He spoke into existence this world. 
What makes you think that something won't happen? He's not going to, oh, tell him to pull out the machine guns or whatever it is. No, he's just going to speak. Now, there's something else that happens, I believe, and you have to put a lot of pieces together. But we have this unforgettable picture. What is the weapon? It's, it's a sword. It's the sword of his mouth. It's the truth. Jesus Christ has no physical, material, carnal, fleshly weapons made on earth. No, it's just him, his word. He doesn't need him. Never did need him. So what is this final event that happens? When Jesus Christ comes to earth, everyone who does not know Jesus Christ, and I can't put all the pieces together exactly now, but his glory is going to be seen. Now remember when Moses was coming down the hill after giving, again, he says, I want to see your glory. He saw the backside. Or when he got the Ten Commandments, he came down. He was beaming in radiance. And that was restrained. And it says, no man can see God and live. The radiance of God's light, like this angel coming from the sun, we need special bodies for eternity. Their flesh will be consumed by the simple glory of God's presence along with his word. He's not going to say, here, take this. But when he speaks, it will be just and righteous. And everyone will know that the judgment was right and is fair. We often forget in Hebrews 4, 12, even now, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing as far as division is soul and the spirit, both in joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. See, when a person becomes a believer, this is what happens. The word of God gets in here, and the word becomes flesh in us, and it changes, it cleans us out. This is powerful for us, but, but when he comes back and he speaks that word of God, the end will come. But here's the thing for you and me. There's a destiny for every true believer now. What do you mean? Our future hope includes three points I want you to leave with. One, everyone who is alive at the rapture will be caught up to be with them prior to this. The church is looking for the rapture. There's nothing that has to happen. It could happen now. Second, his return. Every true believer will come back on his return. And three, we will rule and reign with him. But this is true for the church, not for those who have not trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Father, thank you this morning for your word. And Lord, our prayer is today that your word would become flesh in us, changing us, transforming us day by day, empowering us to bring your great commission, your great word to a lost world. Lord, we want the world to know you. We don't want to see anybody go through this time when you come back. Lord, thank you that you died upon the cross and help us that we never, ever take that lightly. But realize how much you love sinful man that you gave yourself for him. By believing in him, we can have eternal life that you come into our hearts, that you change us, you transform us when we call upon your name, when we surrender our will to you. Father, if there's anybody who has not surrendered themselves to you, Lord, open their hearts up now. 
There's anyone that watches on the internet, Lord, we pray that if they've not opened their heart up, they will open their heart up to you. Thank you for your good and perfect plan to redeem sinful man unto yourself. In Jesus' name, amen.